Chapter Seven of Elusive Isabel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elusive Isabel by Jacques Futrelle. Chapter Seven: The Signal. And the original question remains unanswered," remarked Mr. Campbell. "The original question," repeated Mr. Grimm. "'Where is Prince Benedetto de Bruzzi, the secret envoy?' his chief reminded him. "'I wonder,' mused the young man, "'if the Latin compact is signed in the United States—' "'The Latin compact will not be signed in the United States,' Mr. Grimm interrupted. And then, after a moment, "'Have we received any further reports on Miss Thorne? I mean reports from our foreign agents?' The chief shook his head. "'Inevitably, by some act or word, she will lead us to the Prince,' declared Mr. Grimm and the moment he is known to us everything becomes plain sailing. We know she is a secret agent. I expected a denial, but she was quite frank about it, and I had no intention whatever of placing her under arrest. I knew someone was in the adjoining room because of a slight noise in there, and I knew she knew it. She raised her voice a little, obviously for the benefit of whoever was there. From that point everything I said and did was to compel that person, whoever it was, to show himself. His chief nodded understandingly. Mr. Grimm was silent for a little, then went on. "'The last possibility in my mind at that moment,' he confessed, "'was that the person in there was the man who shot Signor Alvarez. Frankly, I had half an idea that, that it might be the prince in person.' Suddenly his mood changed. "'And now our lady of mystery may come and go as she likes, because I know. Even if a dozen of our men have ransacked Washington in vain for the prince, she will inevitably lead us to him. And that reminds me. I should like to borrow Blair and Hastings and Johnson. Please plant them so they may keep constant watch on Miss Thorne. Let them report to you, and wherever I am I will reach you over the phone. By the way, what was in that sealed package that was taken from Signor Alvarez? Campbell inquired curiously. It had something to do with some railroad franchises, responded Mr. Grimm as he rose. I sealed it again and returned it to the Signor. Evidently it was not what Signor Petrozzini expected to find. In fact, he admitted it wasn't what he was looking for. For a little while the two men gazed thoughtfully, each into the eyes of the other. Then Mr. Grimm entered his private office, where he sat for an hour with his immaculate boots on his desk, thinking. A world war. He had been thrust forward by his government to prevent it. Subtle gray-blue eyes. His Highness Prince Benedetto de Bruzzi. A haunting smile and scarlet lips. At about the moment he rose to go out, Miss Thorne, closely veiled, left the Venezuelan legation, and walked rapidly down the street to a corner, where, without a word, she entered a waiting automobile. The wheels spun, and the car leaped forward. For a mile or more it wound aimlessly in and out, occasionally bisecting its own path. Finally Miss Thorne leaned forward, and touched the chauffeur on the arm. "'Now,' she said. The car straightened out into a street of stately residences, and scuttled along until the placid bosom of the Potomac came into view beside that for a few minutes, then over the bridge to the Virginia side, and the dilapidated little city of Alexandria. The car did not slacken its speed, but wound in and out through dingy streets, past tumble-down negro huts, for half an hour, before it came to a standstill in front of an old brick mansion. "'This is number ninety-seven, the chauffeur announced. Miss Thorne entered the house with a key, and was gone for ten minutes, perhaps. She was readjusting her veil when she came out, and stepped into the car silently. Again it moved forward, onto the end of the dingy street, and finally into the open country. Three, four, five miles, perhaps, out the old Baltimore Road, and again the car stopped, this time in front of an ancient colonial farmhouse. Outwardly the place seemed to be deserted. The blinds, battered and stripped of paint by wind and rain, were all closed, and one corner of the small veranda had crumbled away from age and neglect. A narrow path, strewn with pine needles, led tortuously up to the door. In the rear of the house, rising from an old barn, a thin pole with a cup-like attachment at the apex thrust its point into the open above the dense, odorous pines. It appeared to be a wireless mast. Miss Thorne passed around the house and entered the barn. A man came forward and kissed her, a thin little man of indeterminate age, drying his hands on a piece of cotton waste. His face was pale with the pallor of one who knows little outdoor life his eyes deep-set and a-glitter with some feverish inward fire, and the thin lips were pressed together in a sharp line. 
Beside him was a long bench on which were scattered tools of various sorts, fantastically shaped chemical apparatus, two or three electric batteries of odd sizes, and ranged along one end of it, in a row, were a score or more of metal spheroids, a shade larger than a one-pound shell. From somewhere in the rear came the clatter of a small gasoline engine, and still farther away was an electric dynamo. "'Is the test range, Rosa?' the little man queried eagerly in Italian. "'The date is not fixed yet,' she replied in the same language. "'It will be, I hope, within the next two weeks, and then—' "'Fame and fortune for both of us,' he interrupted with quick enthusiasm. "'Ah, Rosa, I have worked and waited so long for this, and now it will come, and with it the dominion of the world again by our country. How will I know when the date is fixed? It would not be well to write me here.' My lady of mystery stroked the slender, nervous hand caressingly, and a great affection shone in the blue-gray eyes. At eight o'clock on the night of the test, she explained, still speaking Italian, a single light will appear at the apex of the Capitol Dome in Washington. That is the signal agreed upon. It can be seen by all in the city, and is visible here from the window of your bedroom. Yes, yes, he exclaimed. The feverish glitter in his eyes deepened. "'If there is a fog, of course you will not attempt the test,' she went on. "'No, not in a fog,' he put in quickly. "'It must be clear.' "'And if it is clear, you can see the light in the dome without difficulty. "'And all your plans are working out well?' "'Yes, and yours. "'I don't think there is any question but that both England and the United States will buy. "'Do you know what it means? "'Do you know what it means?' "'He was silent a moment, his hands working nervously, then with an effort.' "'And his highness?' "'His highness is safe.' The subtle eyes grew misty, thoughtful for a moment, then cleared again. "'He is safe,' she repeated. "'Mexico and Venezuela were,' he began. "'We don't know yet what they will do. The Venezuelan answer is locked in the safe at the legation. I will know what it is within forty-eight hours.' She was silent a little. "'Our difficulty now, our greatest difficulty, is the hostility of the French ambassador to the compact.' His government has not yet notified him of the presence of Prince de Bruzzi. He does not believe in the feasibility of the plan, and we have to—to to proceed to extremes to prevent him working against us. But they must see the incalculable advantages to follow upon such a compact, with the vast power that will be given to them over the whole earth by this. He indicated the long, littered work-table. They must see it. They will see it, Luigi, said Miss Thorne gently. And now— how are you? Are you well? Are you comfortable? It's such a dreary old place here. I suppose so, he replied, and he met the solicitous blue-gray eyes for an instant. Yes, I am quite comfortable, he added. I have no time to be otherwise, with all the work I must do. It will mean so much. They were both silent for a time. Finally Miss Thorne walked over to the long table, and curiously lifted one of the spheroids. It was a sinister-looking thing, nickeled, glittering. At one end of it was a delicate vibratory apparatus, not unlike the transmitter of a telephone, and the other end was threaded, as if the spheroid was made as an attachment to some other device. "'With that we control the world!' exclaimed the man triumphantly. "'And it's mine, Rosa, mine!' "'It's wonderful,' she mused softly. "'Wonderful! And now I must go. I may not see you again until after the test, because I will be watched and followed wherever I go.' If I get an opportunity, I shall reach you by telephone. But not even that, unless it is necessary. There is always danger. Always danger, she repeated thoughtfully. She was thinking of Mr. Grimm. I understand, said the man simply. And look out for the signal. The light in the apex of the Capitol Dome, she went on. I understand the night must be perfectly clear, and you understand that the test is to be made promptly at three o'clock by your chronometer? "'At three o'clock,' he repeated. For a moment they stood with their arms around each other, then tenderly his visitor kissed him and went out. He remained looking after her vacantly, until the chug-chug of her automobile, as it moved off down the road, was lost in the distance, then turned again to the long work-table. End of chapter 7